build themselves up as being more than an athlete, preparing for life after their sport, after college, because the ball does go flat, whatever sport you play, like, you know. That could have been a book title, Monique. (laughs) The ball does go flat. When you put in the work, don't get so attached to the result behind it. Like you just have to put in the work. And if it doesn't happen the way you want it to, who are you becoming in the process of the work that you put in? That's the most important part. If it was up to me, this book would have been out a long time ago, Mm. but I have, to, I've had to learn how to be patient and how to trust the process, how to release it, how to let, just let go and trust that everything is going to happen how it's meant to. Monique Billings, superstar basketball player and all around, <laughs> I'm going to call you a modern Renaissance athlete because you do so many things. It's truly incredible. And if you're watching on video, people, she is running with this right now. Um, <laughs> So we're connecting on the occasion of your wonderful book launch, but there's so many things that we can talk about. Um, Let's talk about that that book launch first. And then, of course, we'll get back to uh, the content. But I'd love to hear your journey from uh, starting out as a a, a hot young basketball player and then Mm -hmm. going, taking it all the way to the big time. Wow, it's crazy. And a journey is exactly what it is. It's been about two and a half years for me throughout this whole process from when I started writing to now holding the book in my hand, which is it's so surreal. Um, I'm big on health and wellness. I feel like that has always just kind of been my niche. And I always wanted to I wanted people to understand where I'm coming from or have that same feeling that I feel like I feel good when I wake up. Like I, like you said earlier, like I'm positive and I'm happy. I want everyone to feel like that. So I was telling my manager that he was like, you need to write a book. And I was like, isn't that what you do when you're like 40? Like I don't want to <laughs> write a book. I don't want to write a book. Not right now. It's like not my time, not my season for that. But I do feel like we all have a purpose in life. We all have a calling. And so I will say it felt like it was a calling. Um, so I just started writing. I was playing abroad. I was in Russia. I had just finished my third WNBA season and then I went to Russia. So it's a Russian winter. So I'm not going outside. I'm not doing too much. So I'm literally just in my apartment writing. And it was almost, it was just very monastic. I would say like I would take time every single night and it just felt like I naturally love journaling, but it just felt like I was just journaling, getting all my thoughts off. And then I have an editor who was amazing. Um, DJ Booker is his name. And he edited my book and turned it into what it is today. So the title is called Finding Balance, a playbook for wellness. Um, We're looking on your Instagram. You're doing your morning meditations and you have all these other attributes. And I should say, this is not necessarily connected to athletics. And I, I don't feel like the athletic population is tapped into things like balance or wellness. So um, I don't know, what's what what's your uh, perception there? I really want this book just to be for everybody because wellness is for everybody. It's not just for athletes. It's not for non-athletes either. Um, it's really just a holistic thing that everyone can tap into if they want to. But I'm coming from an athlete perspective. So in the book, I'm addressing how my whole life being Um, a young athlete to now a professional athlete, I've been taught how to train my body, but I was never really taught how to train my mind. Mm. And so I have to be very intentional every single day and make sure I'm in taking the right nutrients, just like I'm eating the right thing. So my body feels good. I have to make sure I'm listening to the right things. So my spirit feels good. I have to make sure I'm reading the right things and being um, super cognizant of what I'm intaking spiritually, mentally, physically, all of that. And so what I'm picking up here is something that's kind of uh, apart from the athletic experience, because generally, especially when you get to be a high level player, which you were as a young person, it's all about winning and the, the, the system, even the coaches, the teammates, the whole system is calibrated toward the end goal. And they don't give a Mm -hmm. crap if you're balanced or spiritual or feeling good in the morning. They just want you to pull the rebounds. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, so you kind of had to branch out uh, beyond the narrow path of the athlete, which I would say is difficult because we're demanding so much of you as an athlete. I don't I don't care if you meditate or not. I just want to see you pulling down that rebound. So how did all this integrate in it? 
at what point did you realize there was a bigger world out there? I would say in college. And we were just speaking of UCLA. Shout out to UCLA. Dun, uh, tsh, hey. dun, uh. <laughs> um, great experience at UCLA. My head coach, she actually did pour into us as a collective, our team, um, as women before athletes. So she gave us those tools and taught us how to become women, you know, and I think that's really important. And not everyone has that opportunity. Um, Young men as well. They don't have those opportunities like I had. I was blessed to be able to be put in that position to be given those tools. But like I said, like I, I felt good learning how to train my mind. I'm like, I want more of this. So I'm like, what does that look like? How do I do that? That led me to figuring out who I am outside of what I do. And that's something that I didn't really understand in college, but Mm. that's what this book is about. And it's about figuring out and understanding who you are outside of what you do. Like, what's your character? If you're not pulling down those rebounds, if you're in a slump, if you aren't feeling like your best self, how do you get back to that? So um, I give keys and just steps that I would say have worked for me throughout my journey. And I'm still figuring it out. I don't have it all figured out, but Um, like I said, I just wanted to share with the world what has been put inside of me. So you're saying, uh, I I would, I would say that's unique that the program actually supported this. You're talking about coach Corey Close, who, uh, my son was involved with the UCLA program just after you, you didn't cross paths, but he had a great experience there too, as, as a scout team player. So he was part of the practice uh, situation there. And you see coaches, uh, kind of presenting themselves as um, holistic or, or talking in these high-minded ideals, but then it turns out a lot of times to be just talk. Um, mm-hmm. And so what you're saying is that this was, Corey was the real deal and she was fostering an environment that was more than just winning and chewing yeah. up and spitting out players. Exactly. And the action spoke for that because she was bringing in mentors of hers and other people who have gone through the system at UCLA, just different resources for us to tap into. And I feel like as a young, not even adult, just a young teen, young adult, maybe being in that space, that 18 to 21 year old range, it's like, that's a, those are very important times to figure out who you are outside of what you do. And so her bringing in those resources, I feel like were awesome. And all we had to do was tap into it. And Mm. not everyone did, you know, maybe it wasn't their season for that. Maybe later down the line, they will, but Um, I try to tap in as much as I can and take advantage of those resources. Those people who came into our program would speak to us and pour into us. I guess it would uh, theoretically help you cope with what's a a whole bunch of pressure as that young athlete. And you're describing yourself as, you know, in those maturing years. So you weren't, you weren't all 100% swagger, even though you're a good player. (laughs) I mean, tell us kind of how that struggle looks behind the scenes when everyone's watching you, they're counting on you, you're this many stars of a recruit, so you're getting attention Mm -hmm. even before you turn into um, the maturing woman, you're just a kid in high school, but all of a sudden you're, um, especially these days, Mm -hmm. there's so much attention on you. Well, I will tell you, it is no joke. And especially these days with social media, it, I feel like adds so much more pressure because everyone is looking at a highlight reel. These young kids <laughs> don't only feel the pressure on the court, on the field, wherever, you know, whatever sport they're playing, they're also feeling pressures when they pick up their phone and they leave the court or they leave the field. And so I know it's hard and I feel for those kids. And so this um, book is really for them. I mean, it's mm. for everyone, but I was writing to my younger self when I wrote this book. Yeah. Um, it, it like you brought up pressure. It is, it is a lot of pressure. It's not easy. Um, imagine waking up in the morning, you have practice, you have lift, you got to go to class, your body's sore, but you have to do it. You have class for three to five hours throughout the day. After class, you go to tutoring, you got to eat at some point and study. It's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to try to balance. Yeah. I don't think the average person realizes how much time is dedicated to the program and you hear people talking about oh I, I think there was some people that were against the nil and saying look these athletes get a free education it's like no no it's not free because they work 40 hours a week for the sports program literally they they own you pretty much year round i'm so excited for the nil like i think it's fantastic that 
kids are able to monetize on um, their brand, on their personalities, and really just build themselves up as being more than an athlete, preparing for life after their sport, after college, because the ball does go flat, whatever sport you play, like, you know. <laughs> that could have been a book title, Monique. <laughs> the ball does go I, flat, finding I balance. Right. I had yeah. to have stolen that from somebody somewhere down the line. But, um, you know, it doesn't last forever. So figuring out who you are outside of your sport is just, it's key. It's so important. But back to NIL, like it is exciting for these young kids. I'm almost like, can I get a couple years of my eligibility back? So I can, you know, capitalize on it. <laughs> yeah, it opens up so many things, including just the uh, the, the true um, economic fair play of what the athletes bring to the to the table and the attention and the the revenue they bring. So, yeah, open season, love it. Now, in your the bio for the book, it says you've overcome many obstacles in your climb to the top and have seen many succumb to life's pressure along the way. So. Um, why don't you tell us, let's let's go back a little bit to the beginning when um, you first started to become a basketball prodigy and perhaps saw the opportunities ahead of you and having mm -hmm. to negotiate things at a young age. And um, maybe we can just kind of work toward our, our present day, especially your, your global odyssey of playing all over the place besides Atlanta. Thank you so much. Um, man, I had no idea when I was a young girl that I would be where I'm at today. No idea. I, I would say I almost didn't dream big enough. I'm from a small city called Corona, California, and it's right outside of LA. But where I'm from, like, no one makes it to the pros. You know, no one has this superstar lifestyle. And so I didn't know that that could be a possibility for me. But at the same time, that was me not only not dreaming big enough, but being humble which there's a balance to that in mm. itself because you want to be humble so you don't get humbled. But at the same time, like <laughs> if I could tell my younger self anything, it would be to dream big and to go after it and have the dreams that scare you. Like that's totally okay. And go chase it. But um, obstacles, I would say it, for me, that started with my sport began maybe in, in high school. I wasn't a McDonald's All-American. I was, I was slept on. And definitely had the capability to be and the potential to be, but I wasn't. And so that was frustrating for me. Um, I just had to work. I just had to continue to work. A couple months later, I get invited to my first USA camp, which was super exciting. I didn't make that team, but the next camp that I ended up doing, I did make. So that was um, a great achievement. But I do feel like in my career, there have been many times where I've been slept on, even in the WNBA draft. Um, being in the draft room, expected to go top 10, I fall to 14 or 15. Um, I don't even know because it doesn't matter at this point. It's like once you're here, you're here and like you work to solidify yourself. A, a number doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're number one. It doesn't matter if you're number 32. Like the work that you put in on your journey, that's what matters. The, what you produce, that's what matters. And that's what I've learned. But there have been trials. Um, Thank God I haven't been injured seriously this mm. past season. I had an ankle sprain. So that was another hurdle, another injury. But something that my dad had instilled in me when I was in college, um, I was saying, why me? Why me? Being so dramatic, like we're trained to be. And he said, why not you? That shifted everything for me. Like my whole perspective changed. Why not me? Like I'm not above any injury. I'm not mm. above any um hardships I'm not above any of that and so yeah. I need to embrace whatever's put in front of me I know that God is going to see me through and just stay faithful and stay grounded to the process do you think you were when you say slept on I love that I love that expression I haven't heard that were you a deserving uh, McDonald's All-American and, and making those teams were you, do you feel like you were overlooked or you needed to level your game up a little bit which one was it I was definitely overlooked uh -huh. and I was in the pool. Like I was being looked, being recruited, but something that I have learned is the politics behind everything. Um, you don't go to a certain camp. You're not going to get um, notoriety from certain scouts or certain blog bloggers that, you know, pick the candidates of a McDonald's all American stuff like that. So I don't even want to blame it on that, you know, but how I do feel, I do feel like I was, I was slept on. 
Yeah, it's it's still kind of ridiculous how lousy of a job these highly sophisticated recruiting and scouting things do. And um, it's like when you see a player who's, um, you know, undersized or something for their position, Russell Wilson yeah. falling way back in the draft, just like Monique. It's like, mm-hmm. come on, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, they're stuck in these patterns where yeah. I guess you don't, you can't see the player's heart or you can't see some of the intangibles, but it's also just so, you know, so, so glitzed up. Um, at some point, um, maybe we'll uh, evolve the system and be able to be more selective or, or give, you know, people a chance that uh, show something special. But um, I guess that, you know, serves to, I guess it could have served to discourage you and, and put you back a step or, you know, you, you form that belief in yourself. But I, and since I, I need to come up with a question here, you talked about, you know, that fine line between dreaming big and dreaming really big out of Corona to go make it to the WNBA, but not too big because I think, especially in our era today, we have the posers and, um, you know, the people that are full of fluff and they're doing too much time dreaming and not enough time shooting free throws. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's finding the balance between that pun intended. Um, you know, it's, it's all about believing in yourself, keeping that faith, but also putting in the work to do it. Um, and if it doesn't happen, I was just listening to a soundbite yesterday from Inky Johnson, who is a mentor of mine. Um, just when you put in the work, don't get so attached to the result behind it. Like you just have to put in the work. And if it doesn't happen the way you want it to, who are you becoming in the process of the work that you put in? That's the most important part. And that's what the journey is all about. Like we have to release the expectations. We have to release the outcome. Outcome detachment is a big thing. Something that I am still working on and I am focused Mm. on and really trying to embrace because it's hard. We all want um, the mountaintop moments. We want to be the champion. We want all of those things. Everyone does. The work to get there is not easy at all. It's not easy. It's not sexy. It's not always fun. It can be mundane, but when you put your head down and you do that work, it's like, who are you becoming in that process? That's greatness. Whether okay. you win or not, that, that in itself is just greatness. Okay. Now I want everybody to push that 30 second backward button on the podcast player <laughs> and listen to that again. That was so beautiful. And for a young athlete to speak in those terms, I mean, it, it took me many decades to come to that realization that it was all about uh, you know, appreciating every step of the process and releasing your attachment to the outcome. And I was going to ask you, but you answered it yourself. Like, do you have to check on that every single day and recommit to that incredibly yeah. difficult goal to, uh, you know, to make it all about the process? Because, yeah. you know, when you, when you succeed and uh, mm-hmm. let's say, Hey, you did get drafted. Now you can coast like um, who was, Oh, it's coach Alford. Uh, he wrote a book former UCLA coach where, you know, he was two-time NCAA player of the year. He made it to the NBA. That was his highest dream in life. And then he said he just coasted because it's like, now what? He was all about the outcome Mm. of making it to the pros. And so he went and played golf and didn't work on his game anymore and had a shorter career than he deserved. So it's kind of funny, like you can even get in trouble when you reach all your goals and then, you know, blow up and become too big for your britches. Mm, That's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good just to continue to challenge yourself, though. You know, even when you hit that ceiling, that glass ceiling of you thought this was going to be it. This is what you wanted. You made it. Okay, what's next? Like, let's keep hustling. Let's keep grinding. How can I continue to better myself? Um, My favorite quote, which is in my book, is to be better than yesterday, not as good as tomorrow. Like, how can Uh I continue to strive for greatness and excellence? Uh, and in your case, you are sprinkling in all these other ambitions to do yeah. some uh, commentating. Mm-hmm. You're very professional with your social media. I mean, you're obviously having a good time and traveling the world, yeah. but you got uh, collaborations and it's it's a very um, uh, streamlined operation. You're doing Thank speaking you. and then you're taking on this massive book project. So how does that uh, mix in with your important devotion to basketball here in the prime of your career still I mean we keep the main thing the main thing I just came from a workout you know like I just got it in so I'm always going to basketball's priority right now while I'm playing while I'm in my prime just entering my prime like I'm gonna make sure that I I work out 
Um, not just my body, my mind and my spirit as well every single day. And along with that, taking breaks. Like I was just on a two week vacation. Like it's mm. so good to take breaks and to recharge, refresh. So you come back even stronger. Basketball is always going to be the priority. But while I am, I have this great platform. Um, I'm like, why not? Why not do all the things? Why not squeeze all the juice out of the, the lemon while I can? And so I'm having a blast. Um, I, I plan to continue, God willing, being able to do all these amazing things, traveling the world, being able to play abroad, meeting so many people, great people, connecting with people. Like that's what life is about. This is the journey. You know, I, I do have my long term goals and things that I see in my future. But... Watch out, people. Watch out. <laughs> but right now, I just want to enjoy the moment, enjoy every single day, whether I'm um, going through different battles, various battles, whether I'm um, just, I don't know, fighting. It's, it's me versus me. So fighting through that every single day. I just want to make sure that I'm having fun and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I suppose, especially someone like you, maybe not for everybody, but if you were just to practice and train for basketball and then come home and play video games and eat ice cream, it might not <laughs> be as as a good a success formula as branching mm -hmm. out into all those other areas. I think it does help you find balance from just being obsessed with uh, with sport because that's not an easy that's not an easy route for anybody. I think a lot of people think that's what the athlete does is they, you know, mm. they, they play, they practice, they go home and veg out, but um, that might not be a winning formula. I do want to add to that though. Everybody's different. So for mm -hmm. some people that is their winning formula and that mm. makes them feel like the best version of themselves. And maybe in another season of life, they'll find a different system or routine that works for them. But if that is working for them and they feel good, shoot, go with it. That doesn't work for me personally. I I just, I can't function like that. I love having so many other interests, and passions, having the um, possibilities and just the resources to be able to attain all of those things that I'm trying to. But not everybody is like that. You know, not everybody wants to be a television personality or mm. wants to be a broadcaster. And that's not everyone's journey. Um, that's been mine for a very long time. So I'm like, I'm going to pursue all the things while I can. But like I said, everybody is just, everybody's different, but they have to be able to find what works for them. What is your big giant, uh, future, future dream? Do you want to share it? That's a great question. I would say, I don't know if I have a big giant one because it changes like all the time, but one of my goals for the future is just to be a television personality outside of sports. You know, I still mm. want to broadcast, but I want to be a lifestyle personality. I want to be on the red carpet talking about outfits and dresses, interviewing people, um, even taking it ab abroad because I love traveling. So being a global personality, I think that is a really big goal of mine. Can you describe like uh, a typical daily pattern for a professional basketball player these days? And also totally. you can sprinkle in how you throw your other uh, hobbies and, and career goals into the mix? Yeah, absolutely. So it depends on like what season you're in. So if you're in season, at me and most of, I would say my colleagues, we're very much so the first athlete that you reference. You know, you go to practice, you go home, you veg out on healthy food, and you do it all again the next day. I mean, sometimes you can watch Netflix, you watch film, whatever, but for me, and like I said, a lot of my friends, like we like to just rest while we're in season because season is, it's rapid, it's quick. Something's always happening. So it's good just to be able to find those pockets of rest while you can, because it's not always going to come. And that keeps you sharp. That keeps you the best for your game. But in the off season, I feel like that's a great time to pursue um, whatever you're interested in. So if that's doing an internship, that's traveling. Most women in the WNBA play overseas. A lot of people don't know that. So during this time, a lot of us will play overseas, which I've had beautiful experiences playing overseas. But yeah, I'm in my off season right now. So I have more time. You know, I'm not focusing on games. I'm not in game mode. And when I'm in game mode, I'm super locked in. But when I'm in the off season, it's a different level of locked in. Like I'll do my workouts in the morning, but then in the afternoon, like I might have a game to go broadcast or mm. um, 
I might just want to go to the spa for the day and relax, or I might just want to go shopping, or I might just book a trip for the weekend. Like this weekend, I'm going home, I'm going back to Cali. So I'm excited for that. You know, the off season, there's so many more things that you're able to do. Um, So it just depends on the time that an athlete is in. What kind of broadcasting are you doing now? So broadcasting for Pac-12 Network. Oh, really? I broadcast broadcast for the Atlanta Hawks. So, yeah. So squeezing in, you're you're in off-season from both the international leagues as well as WNBA, but that seems to get pretty busy when you have the the, the season for Atlanta Dream WNBA. And then in, in a few short years, you've played your, your bios like Russia, Australia, Israel, Korea, China. Tell us about ten, that. 10 countries in <laughs> five years. Wow. And it's been beautiful. Like, it's not, it doesn't always seem like it's the most glamorous of lifestyles, but it is such a blessing. And I see it in that way because I'm able to connect with so many people. I have friends all over the world. Like I can call my friends in Russia and I can call my friends in Korea, Israel. I've been to so many places. I have connections in all of those places. So it's been a journey. It's been a beautiful journey. Um, I plan on continuing to play abroad. Something coming up in the near future. Can't announce it yet, but I will be playing somewhere soon, possibly. So yeah, it's been it's been great. Uh, and these are like shorter seasons, but you can also have an opportunity to make um, as much or more or significantly more salary than the WNBA, which is where most of the public in America sees you and associates you with. Is that, does exactly. that sound accurate? Yeah. So the season, it depends on where you go. It can be anywhere from eight months to four months. It just depends on where you go. And you can manage that uh, along with the WNBA season. Mm-hmm. WNBA season is a summer season, so it starts in May, late April, May-ish, and then it ends in like September, October. And then usually WNBA players have about two weeks off, and then we go overseas. Okay, so if you're in off-season training mode now, um, Mm -hmm. describe how you go from morning to night. So morning, I wake up, I pray, meditate, journal, do all that stuff, cook some good food. Then I go work out. Um, Like I said, I just came from the gym. So I did a lift and then I'll get on the court for about an hour. Then I come home and sometimes I'll have various tasks, like um, just things I have to do around the house. But um, cooking is big for me. So I love cooking. Just anything that makes me feel good, like resting, refueling, watching movies. Um, lately it's been sitting outside on my patio in my backyard. Like that's been really nice. So I don't typically have this much time off. So it's been beautiful being able to to figure out like, what do I want to do today? You know, doing interviews and being interviewed by amazing people like yourself. So different things like that throughout my day. Uh, what about a in-season pattern when you're uh, traveling, preparing for games? What does that routine look like? In season, I'm a lot more focused. So same morning routine, wake up, say my prayers, journal, do all that good stuff. Again, eat some great food, go to practice. And I'm in the gym for maybe like five hours watching film, getting recovery on my body, going through practice, weights, all that stuff. Um, More recovery, excuse me, all of these things um, just to make sure I'm feeling good, make sure I'm feeling like the best version of myself. And then again, I come home. Um, usually when I'm in season, I when I come home, I'm done for the day. I'm tired. We just practice. I'm in the gym for five hours. Like I'm taking a nap. So usually I'll take a nap. And um, after my nap, I'll get some food, maybe hang out with some of my teammates. But I keep it light. I like to just relax. What are some of the recovery uh, methodologies that have worked for you and some of your favorite training? um practices i don't know if it's certain weight routine or calisthenics or mobility exercises what are the what are your favorite stuff i am a yogi i love yoga i try to do yoga every single day in season out of season um out of season i do hot yoga so i've been doing that it's been kicking my butt it is hard but it's so good uh especially mentally just pushing through and like telling myself like i got this i can do this um in season just I have all the tools, all the gadgets, the Norma Tech, 
the um, hyper rice guns and all of those things. Um, I'm constantly getting massaged, maybe mm. like every other day. I mm. personally love massage, so I'm always on the table. And I'm very proactive when it comes to my body. So like I said, I'm always stretching, doing some type of yoga, active recovery in the pool. I just, I listen to my body and whatever my body needs in that moment, I just make sure to give her. How do you think the overall athletic population is doing there? Do you see a lot of your teammates similarly committed to all that? I would say on different levels, you know, everybody is different. So I think I'm kind of extreme when it comes to my level of recovery and how I take care of myself. But in order to be a pro athlete, you have to have some type of method of recovery, some type of routine. So I commend all of my colleagues who are in the league because it's not easy to maintain your body, to maintain mm. um, just everything that it takes to be a professional athlete. Yeah, it seems like that awareness and the commitment is escalating in recent years where, I don't know, a decade ago or two decades ago, they would, uh, the talented players would show up into the professional leagues. They play their game, they go out and uh, goof around and not pay much attention to anything except the next game. And now it's like, as you describe, you're going to work every day. You're in the gym or in the training facility for hours and hours doing one thing or another toward your recovery and your performance. That's pretty, pretty awesome. This is my job. This is my nine to five. This is how I feed my family. And so, yeah, I take it seriously. So let's talk about the book now. It started with you. You've had a habit of journaling and then you started to envision this idea of, oh, look at that cover. If you're watching on on YouTube, she's got the tree. Po what's that called? The tree pose where you get your foot on your thigh yeah. and rest. Mm -hmm, oh, very mm -hmm, nice balance. Mm -hmm. A balancing pose from Monique on the cover of her book. Um, who knew she was a professional basketball player? She looks like a yoga instructor on there. Um, but how did that take shape over the last two and a half years? And then talk about some of the key features of the book. You can even go over your favorite sections or whatever. Yeah. So after, like I said, my manager really encouraging me to step out on faith and write this book, I wrote for a year and a half. Um, my editor, we would go back and forth. He would give me different suggestions. We would kind of just gloss it up. He did a beautiful job. So that took about almost a year in itself of editing. So we finished last December of editing. And it's so amazing going through this book process because I didn't know how much it takes. It takes a lot. And you have to have a very dedicated and committed team, which I do. And I'm so grateful for my team um, who's helping me produce um, this book. So it's, yeah, since last December when we finished, we, uh, I had a photo shoot in LA. My some of my, two of my best friends um, took the photos and the videos, um, the behind the scenes and the cover photo from my book. So that was very special. Um, being able to choose the images and choose the fonts and the text and all the different things that I want to go in the book. My um, editor had helped me with that and um, my illustrator. So yeah, it's in the, since I would say December, since last December when I finished, it's just been a whole nother process of itself. I thought once I finished writing, I thought it was like, okay, it's good. Like we're ready to go, but that's, that's not the case. There's so much more that goes with that. And just making sure I want the book to feel good. I want when people open it up, I want them to, to really feel it and to really be in it. And it's a, it's a very light read. It's an easy read. I wanted it to be that way. So anyone is able to read it. There's a lot of just little motivational quotes in there. I sought out different professional athletes like Solomon Thomas, um, Angel McCautry, mentors of mine, David Meltzer. Um, and they have put little pieces and little gems mm. of their own thoughts and opinions within this book. So I thought that was very special and it's just come together so beautifully. It's, I would say it's um, teaching you patience because if it was up to me, this book would have been out a long time ago, mm. but I have, to, I've had to learn how to be patient and how to trust the process, how to release it, how to let, just let go and trust that everything is going to happen how it's meant to. And now as my first publisher told me when I turned in my, proudly turned in my, my finished manuscript, he said, congratulations, you just completed 10% of the work. And the other 90 is marketing, promoting, and getting the word out. So it sounds like you're 
you're putting some good effort in there is this is um uh late 2022 is the book out at this point or what's the release date yes so official launch is november 10th i'm so excited pre-launch is still going on so anyone watching and listening can order the book on my website mobillings.com the book is there um it's also in my instagram bio the link um yeah i'm gonna be releasing on november 10th officially i'm excited because i'm having a couple launch parties with my close friends in atlanta and i'm having one in la i'm gonna be doing a couple signings so yeah, I'm really, really excited. Wow. Sounds like you got some good promo set up. That's awesome. I hope so. <laughs> well, um, you're, you got a, a top secret new uh, team or league to head off to. And it sounds like it's kind of a free for all where you're just, um, um, you know, finding out what opportunities are available all over the globe and considering where you're going to go next season. Exactly. Yeah, you said it best. Just taking everything day by day, going with the flow. What are some of your highlights from from bouncing around all those countries and playing? Tell me about the level of competition compared to the WNBA and all that kind of thing. I would say the level of competition is typically weaker, and that's why they usually bring one or two Americans in to um, help with that. And so usually I'm the only American on my team. It's rare that I'll have another teammate, um, maybe two, but usually like when I was in China, South Korea, um, I was the only American. And so in those countries, those young girls, not young girls, but the the ladies who I'm playing with, they don't speak English for the most part. (laughs) So a lot of times I embrace that. I'm learning Russian. I'm learning Mandarin, depending on where I'm at. And that's fun for me. I lose it. I end up losing it when I leave because I don't have anyone to practice with. But I was actually just playing in Tunisia with the Jordanian team. And so they're trying to teach me Arabic and it's fun. And you asked about the highlight. The highlight is just the people, the people that I'm able to connect with and meet that if it wasn't for basketball, I never would have met. It's just been so beautiful. Like I said, I have friends for life and all of these places that I've played that I do plan on going to visit again. And hopefully one day when I have a family of my own, taking my family to all the places that I've played and um, almost allowing them to experience what I had experienced. So how do you manage on the court if you're, uh, if English is not being bantered about amongst your teammates? <laughs> I wonder if are the coaches usually bilingual where they can kind of intervene with you or you have an interpreter, but that's on the sideline. So how does that work yeah. both on the sideline and on the court? I've dealt with both. So in the Asian <laughs> countries, I had an interpreter. And if the coach swinging their yelling legs, at me, they're waving their arms wildly on the sideline. Your interpreter's <laughs> yeah. going crazy. Everyone's quiet. Literally. What the heck's going on? Oh Man, my gosh. The coach is yelling at me in whatever language he's in. I'm like, I don't understand you. So, you know, you yelling at me doesn't really make sense, but my translator would have to just translate it. And my translators have been so sweet. So they'd be like, well, he said, you know, they're trying to say it. In oh, a very it's calm one of way. those, one of those indirect <laughs> translations. Yes. He says, keep trying hard. <laughs> exactly. When oh I really gosh. just got cussed out. And yeah, right. I probably, I could feel it. I can't understand it, but I can feel it. So I've dealt with that. Um, basketball is universal, though. If you know how to hoop, you know how to hoop. Put the ball in the basket and get some stops on defense. That's universal. That's a language in itself. Uh, so in the book, are we mm-hmm. going to learn about um, some yoga, diet, Is it mostly like mindset, uh, physical stuff? I would say it's mostly mindset. Um, The cover might be a little misleading and I hope it's not, but it's- it's We can go learn our yoga poses somewhere else, but (laughs) the idea that a a pro basketball player is devoted to yoga, that's so cool. It's a a great balance between the the hard work in a sport that's both aerobic and anaerobic. So I think you picked a a good outlet there. Thank you. Yoga has definitely been like a great release for me. Um, And it's allowed me to have a a healthy relationship with basketball. So I'm very grateful for that. But the book itself, it's very mindset driven. Like I said, it's mindset and it's spirit. I want people's spirits to feel good. I want people to feel good on the inside as well as the outside, but feeling good on the inside, being light, showing up as your best self. Those are things that you have to work towards and try to maintain every single day and it is a challenge but you have to recommit and realign every single day and i hope that the book helps people in doing that 
Have you always been this way since you were a little kid, Monique, this kind of uh, outgoing, bright spirit? Or did you oh. kind of develop in in tandem with uh, becoming a, a star athlete and negotiating some of these things? I would say it's always been in me. And thank you. That's a very nice compliment. I would say it's always been in me, but I didn't always know how to manifest it and how to bring it out. Um, I've always been typically, I'm like an introverted extrovert. So mm. I can speak to, you know, crowds of thousands of people. I can broadcast and do all these things, but I'm introverted. Like I like being at home in the comfort of my own home, relaxing, not around too many people, just very low key. And I feel like I've more so always been that, but I've just had great, I've had a great family. My mom, my dad, even my sister who have poured so much into me have given me this wonderful foundation. And there's so many people around me who have also lifted me up and just really taken me under their wing. And I feel like all of that, I, I'm like a sponge. I took all of that in and um, tried to just bring it out in the best way that I possibly could. Oof. Besides that, do you have any complaints about traffic in the Inland Empire? I mean, come on <laughs> <Always>. now. Always. <laughs> yes. Okay, That's finally. That's why I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> finally, we got something We got something negative out of her after, after <laughs> the entire conference. Oh, my goodness. Monique Billings, what a pleasure to connect with you. Best my of God. luck with the Atlanta Dream and your international basketball escapades and all the other cool stuff. I, I strongly urge uh, listeners, viewers to go pre-order that book, Finding Balance follow you on Instagram, all that great stuff. I can't wait to read it myself. And Yay. thanks for listening, everybody. Monique Billings. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Thank you.